what are some of the other uh, implications or, or benefits that, that are associated with upgrading to a higher standard of motor? John, can you talk a little bit about you know, sure. some of the... Sure. I think we're looking at a motor that's more friendly to operate on an adjustable speed drive. Uh, the motor is uh, runs cooler. Um, if it's an air-conditioned plant, that would reduce the heat uh, load for the plant. Um, it's got a smaller fan on it. Uh, it'll run quieter. Uh, generally, they have better uh, balance standards. They're just manufactured to closer tolerances than a than a normal motor. So they're more reliable, essentially. Um, more reliable. We've got a longer warranty with with uh, premium motor. Baldur's warranty is three years. It's five years on our IEEE 841 model. I think that's a key point for the market to gauge. That's that's really to me that's the confidence indicator. It's a better quality product, designed better, and yet, how do I know? Well, it's backed by a stronger warranty. So that should be the confidence factor for the, for the market to recognize. Good. Bruce, anything to add to that? Well, indeed, that is, uh, while we live in this world of energy efficiency, um, the facility manager's world, job one, is keep the facility running and running smoothly with as little downtime as possible. Some of that sort of aversion to risk has played into the fact that they, uh, many facilities do rewind motors that probably are vampires and really mm. should be out of service and should be replaced. But in the interest of you know, a known motor that's operated well over the years, they'll continue to rewind it. Uh, sometimes uh, even when the rewind costs exceed what it would be to replace it with an even premium, perhaps again for the because of the aversion to changing a motor to a different speed and what the implications might be. I think you've hit another key priority though, Bruce. The standard efficient, oldest motor with the highest number of prior repairs is really where this Indeed. opportunity is most significant. So that's a great way to help prioritize the effort as well. Mm -hmm. And it's a significant thing is getting ahead of this for facility people understand their motor population so that they can prioritize it be prepared ahead of time for when a given motor fails, what will be the, uh, the method of dealing with it. Does repair make sense from a fiscal standpoint? Or does replacing it, if replacing it, then look, as Ted pointed out, to other opportunities besides just the motor. Looking at VFDs, looking at transmission issues where the greatest uh, losses truly are. It's a great opportunity to improve the efficacy of the entire system. Can you talk a little bit about you know the the impact of coupling a motor with a VFD and you know how that you know, might exponentially increase the savings? Yeah, I think that uh, it's another aspect to the topic that's not exactly brand new, but I think Bruce should agree the rate of adoption it still tells us there's a significant opportunity. Mm -hmm. A lot of fixed speed equipment that's suitable to operate variable speed has yet to be upgraded. So it's running fixed speed. It may use throttling valves on pump systems or bypass right. loops, it may use outlet dampers on fan systems, those mechanical flow controls, um, that's where a, the most sub substantial opportunity really is. The motor is a good contribution, but replacing those controls and going variable speed is three, four, maybe five times as significant. Mm. John, yeah. what you, I, I know you guys watch this very carefully and, and work closely with end users. You know, why do you think there is that reluctance or you know, there, there's that, that low adoption rate of, of coupling motors and drives? I guess risk. Um, there's a lot of wives' tales about drives are going to burn up motors. Um, that may have been true many years ago, but the NEMA premium motors built today are inverter ready. Um, they're capable of being operated from an inverter. They've got a lot of headroom for temperature rise. Um, we know how to hook up motors, how to wire them so they last. Um, the drives today are better than they have been in the past. Um, when we think about using drives, we think about process control, adjusting all the flow of products so that they're optimized and they save even more energy. Mm -hmm. um, you shut things off when you don't need it running. I mean, the most efficient motor running is one that isn't running. It's not using any energy. So, you know, let's let's look at how we we match flows up. If you've got a mixer that has five pumps going into a common slurry, you can change the ratios of that with drives and, and optimize it. Uh, so process control is something that fits in, into yeah. this as well. 
Well, you know, given that this leg legislation is now here and, you know, the availability of standard of efficient motors is going to dry up over time, you know, everyone's going to have to deal with this sooner or later. What's your recommendation for the best way to approach that? Ted, why don't you start? Well, you know, Bruce alluded to it earlier. I think it's to be prepared, plan out and, and prioritize your applications <coughs> by the horsepower involved, the age of the equipment involved, the run hours, and yeah, if you have multiple plants, then yeah, energy costs are another way to prioritize. Where's the, the quickest returns? But uh, that's the key piece, I think, is to look, a, look at your situation in advance and make a plan, make a strategy. Bruce, your thoughts? Well, in, in spite of the fact that uh, ISA is motor-centric, as we've all discussed, the, the true opportunities here exist in looking at it, um, your facility as motor systems all the way from the wall through a VFD to the motor to transmission and really optimizing that. We see many situations where motors are oversized for the sake of a given motor failed, put more horsepower on it and it, that'll overcome the issue. So there, there are many opportunities. So again, developing a plan and looking not just at the motor, but looking at, well, while I'm looking at it, let's look at the entire system. Yeah. What can we look at with potentially 30, 40% transmission losses that mm -hmm. could be avoided? looking at replacing the motor, putting in VFTs. There are upfront costs, but the savings are, are tremendous. Again, if I might, industrial facilities probably understand that their electricity use, 70-75% uh, of which is entirely motors and motor systems. Mm -hmm. So it really is a, um, the point you have to direct your, your efforts towards. John, anything to add? I'd say, you know, make a plan, have a policy, have a policy on what mo motors you buy, mm -hmm. what motors you repair, um, the repair replace decision, at what point do you repair and replace, uh, both by a horsepower and, and cost basis. Um, when you buy new equipment, you know, be sure to specify what motors you need for those, uh, for those applications. Look at how many hours the motor runs. We've got software that can help you make these, uh, these studies. Uh, there's a Baldor Energy Savings Tool software that will go through and you put your inventory of motors on there, how many hours they run, and it will calculate your energy cost and make suggestions and prioritize what motors uh, you, you might use as replacements. Okay, good. And it goes as far as uh, putting scenarios in there, uh, what if I use a drive on this? What are my energy savings? Mm -hmm. Terrific. Well, thank you all for being with us today. We appreciate your time, and thank you for joining us today. We hope you found our, our webcast helpful in, in helping you understand not only the implications, but also the opportunities associated, associated with the new ESA legislation. If you have any follow-up questions that you'd like to address to any of our panelists, please feel free to contact them directly using the information on your screen now, or call 1-800-526-2626 to reach a command representative nearest you. Thank you.